And with the mirrored lineups, uh, so you know, you imagine the deck lists are at least similar uh, in this aspect. Who do you think actually like has the edge overall in terms of just like we said, Ecop seems pretty confident, whereas Vin seems a little bit. I'm just you know really excited, got lucky to get here, happy to play against people. But Ecop's like, no, no, I'm I'm gonna win this. You know, yeah, so I mean, do you think the edge is there with Ecop or? Yeah, I think it is. I think um, you know. Memes aside, the, the best players do have an edge in this game, and a lot of the stuff at the moment is very skillful, like Druid versus Druid, things can happen with Yogg, etc. But the, the matchup itself is a very skillful matchup with a lot of cards in hand. How you manage your tempo, how you manage your value is really important in that match. Yeah, and what do you think are going to be, say, the, the key matchups within the, the class interactions that could really so, swing the set? Because this is Last Hero Standing, just to remind you guys. So it's one ban, Last Hero Standing. If you win with a deck, you keep it. And, if the, and then your opponent loses, loses that deck. So you can sweep, you can counter pick. Yeah, so I, I cast a very similar lineup with uh, Firebat yesterday, and he, he eloquated the point very, very well, which is basically when these lineups come up against each other, you have to get the Druid to do something. That's your plan, because you're against, uh, you know, potentially aggressive decks in Shamans and Zoos, etc., which, you know, the Druid can sometimes just get rushed down by if they don't get a good rampy start. So the Druid needs to come out of the gates and actually get something done and win one of the matchups that they're a little bit unfavored in because they're the weak link, honestly, in this lineup. So, um, but it, it's weird because, you know, the way Firebat put it is like, Druid doesn't really have any potential like superpower matchups. It's just that sometimes Innovate and Wild Growth will win you matchups you're not even supposed to win. And that's what makes it such a powerhouse as a class. So. That's the situation, that's what's probably going to be matchup defining in this series. Yeah, it's really strange, isn't it, that in like, say, this looks very much like a standard lineup at the moment. Yeah. Druid is the weaker class, and it's like Druid's kind of great at the moment, so it feels really strange, but we are getting into the first match of the day, game one. Melty's Vince versus e -Cup. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Raven. And yeah, as you said, it is... It's in the way of Druid for a very, very long time, where it's like Druid doesn't really have like 70%, 80% matchups against things. It's like 45 to 55 against the field, but sometimes innovate, and then you yeah. just win. And it just gets the job done. Even in the old format with like the, the old combo that everybody misses so fondly, yeah. you know, um, even then it was just a case that it wasn't favorite against many things. It's just like you say, sometimes it gets the win, and that's how Druid's going to continue to be, I think. Um, but this is the exact situation I was talking about at the start. Mel, uh, Vince has, has queued a, his, his Druid into a matchup that it is unfavored in, the Aggro Shaman. So he's going to need to get something done here with his Druid, or else he opens up the series to Ecop being able to do the same thing later. He wins one game with his Druid at some point, and suddenly it's a real, real uphill climb for Vince. But with this hand, uh, with this pair of hands, the Druid could well get something done here. Ecop missing his two drop in Shaman. <laughs> and Vince just having. How many innovates would you like, sir, with that? I mean, you can play an 8-8 this turn, right? Yeah. He's going to choose not to, but he could have actually <laughs> just jammed an 8-8 on the board that turn. Right, and would you have done that? I mean, what are you saving I, for here? Oh, it's, it's scary. I mean, right now, if Flamery Faceless hits the board, you probably lose. Obviously not this turn, mm. but like it, over the course of this game, if the 7-7 seven, seven comes down, you don't have an answer to it right now, so you need to have something there to contest it just in terms of board presence. And you can't spend too long in this matchup without making your push, right? You have to go at some point. You can't just sit back, play removal, play removal. Some point you have to have a teacher turn, a Fandral turn, a big Ancient of War innovated out. And it's around turn four, turn five that you want to be doing those kind of things most of the time. And this is one of the cards uh, we don't see in every Druid deck, but it's one of the cards, I think the whole thing I'm going to talk about today a lot is that Druid is a very complicated class to play, you know, there's things that you do that everybody does, but everything is, says choose one, do this, do that, and yeah. every decision is so important, do you want the six health, do you want the two extra, or two less health now in terms of killing something, mm -hmm. and all your Druid decisions are based on what is left in your deck as well, not just your hand. Oh um, yeah. On, compared to say Shaman, where you're just playing the things in your hand and you know you'll pick up more things that are going to do roughly the same stuff. With Druid, you've got very specific cards you're playing to, specific outs. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's honestly similar to, to Freeze Mage in that sense, where you're trying to, you get into positions sometimes where you just do have to play for your outs, right? You have to trust the, the percentage of direct damage that's in your deck, for example, uh, you know, play to a Yogg that's still in your deck and just burn through spells inefficiently just to set up a Yogg Saron. So um, it's, it's definitely the kind of deck that does that kind of thing, but this is the, the situation I was oh. talking about before, where the 7 7 comes down with no real nice way to contest it, short of throwing your taunt minion and a wrath into it. So if he'd have had an 8-8 on the board this whole time, it might have been a very different story. And those 
free innovates are starting to lose value, although picking up Ancient of War this turn does uh, give them back a little bit more of their utility. Yeah, and that goes back to trusting the deck a little bit as well. Um, getting the Ancient down and so on. Um, basically will allow him to use those innovates to shrink the giant. Yep. But this is a thing that he could have been doing for a, for a long time, honestly. Like, that, sure, that giant's going to get really, really cheap, but how long can he really go without developing a board presence? He's he's lucked out here in the sense of, you know, being able to develop this board, and it looks like he is going to go for the full play and take out the 7-7 seven, seven here and just go for the full board dominance. But still, since he's sat back for so long and let the board be developed, something simple as, like, Flame Tongue Totem here can start chewing apart this 5-10 pretty easily. Right, and Flame Tongue Totem, I mean, with these Divine Shields in particular, yeah. just going to do a whole chunk of damage and, yeah, allow yeah, them like to Yeah, like Flame Tongue Totem Lightning Bolt this turn would just be such a clean play to, to chew through this, so... Um, that Arcane Giant is going to come down a lot later in the game than, than possible, but uh, I don't know. It, it was a really, really all-in play, right? Because if you just play an 8-8 early and they play, like, Feral Spirits, for example, and then your 8-8 is just, like, attacking into one small minion a turn and not really getting the job done, so... I'm not, like, 100% critical of the line. It's just a question of, like, did he need that 8-8 on the board to start fighting back a little bit earlier? Right, and we're seeing him now, and this is something that happens with Druid, with your Innovate. When you... Like, if you use them early, you run with a small hand size, and if you don't use them, you end up with an Innovate that doesn't do anything. Like, next turn at the moment, it's not going to actually... It's going to be true mana you could have had earlier. Yep. Yeah, very true. I mean, Innovate's is always at least going to be able to, to discount the cost of that Arcane Giant, as you said earlier, but that's, that's probably just not enough utility at this point. If he picks up a Nourish, then the Innovate can again become useful to be able to play something in the same turn that you pick up, but uh, the third Innovate proving to be uh, a little bit of a dead card in the scenario at the moment. Right, and like now the Giant's got to a point where it's going to be played anyway. And do you use the Power of the Wild as well and just go all in? And it looks a pretty formidable board that you're up against in this situation if you're Vince. Yeah, so if you if you innovate first, you can play the Giant for uh, five mana and then Power of the Wild. It's still not good enough to like get in a hero power, so it doesn't actually achieve anything. And I think he's just going to drop the Giant here and pass. Yeah, the, the extra health, the extra one health doesn't really make a huge deal on the, the Ancient of War. Like, it, it protects it from exactly the board, right? Like, right. having seven health would be one more than you'd be asking for from the board, but you, you expect that Giant, the, sorry, the, the Taunt to go down pretty easily. So. And no consideration to just making a 3-2 to contest this this wide board? I don't think, I think when you're this low on resources, your your cards with high potential, like Power of the Wild, you need to like save them to try and realize that potential, yeah. right? If you suddenly draw Fandral Staghelm or Power or wow, Violet Teacher. Wow, right on cue. Yeah, if you suddenly get Fandral or Violet Teacher, then that Power of the Wild is so much more explosive right. than it was beforehand. Oh uh, yeah, Vin's played a lot of, sort of dominating cards in this game, but you know, that life total, down to 20 already, and he still hasn't managed to deal with this board. All these Divine Shields, either. Yeah, and uh, Feral Spirits are, are good pickups, honestly, in this situation, because it, it does allow Ecop to you know, stop having to deal with the immediate problem of that 8-6 on the board. It's that situation that I talked about originally, where the, you just say to the Giant, OK, you're just going to be a slow, clunky AA idiot and just have to hit into one of my dudes every turn, and I'm just going to keep going face. but some point that AA is going to have to be dealt with because the ECOP doesn't have the power minions on board, right? It's not right. been it's not been Tuscar Totemix and Thing from below. It's just been you know squires and small minions and totems. So he doesn't have the power on board to compete with an 8-6 and an Azure Drake right now. Something I've been wondering since like the start of Whispers is the taunt on Thing from below meant to be a downside? The number of times you'd like to hide it away behind yeah. other taunts, and I, you, you can't. I agree in many scenarios it is a downside. I don't think it was ever designed that way. I think it's actually supposed to be a defensive card. I think that was the intended usage, that like mid-range shaman could get away with totem pass right. a lot more often and make up for it. it. It just so happens that when you're playing totem golem and flame tongue totem and tuscar totemic anyway, you actually just don't ever have to press totem to get good value out of out Right, of so a 0-5-5 five five is actually a good aggressive card as well. Yeah, who do you? The one, oddly enough. Right. And there's this Fandle value you say that, that he saved the um, power of the wild for one. Yeah. 
And that's, again, it's just a consideration of I'm actually being out-resourced here by my aggro shaman opponent, right? So he, his, his hand was Innovate Power of the Wild, sure. and his, the shaman had like four cards in hand. So in that situation, you can't just play Power of the Wild as a 3-2 because it's just so low value. It loses to one rock biter, for example, and then the resource initiative is maintained by the shaman, whereas by waiting, just being a little bit more patient, he's turned that one 3-2 panther into this entire giant board buff that you right, see. Right, yeah. And Icop's now got to make the decision this turn, do I ever trade again? Yeah, is this the turn? Is right. this the turn where I just ignore everything and start going face? I don't think he really ever gets there if he does that, so uh, addressing the board state is probably at least a consideration, but thing from below comes down here, he might be deciding to make at least a somewhat aggressive play because this leaves him unable to kill the Fandral on the board. So it looks like Ecop is just going to go here. Is he going to use Rockbiter or Lightning Bolt to take out the 4-3 or is this full committal to damage to face? I don't think we see him use the Rockbiter. I think if you're going to go, you're saving the Rockbiter and you've decided you've seen one Ancient of War already. If you draw your Doom Hammer, you're going to win. That's If you're going to go there, I think you're going for that line. Um, and the second nature war just comes off there as I was speaking, so <laughs> that line might be a bit of a disaster for Echo. Yeah, I'm just, you know, wondering, so the expected outcome, or like the average expected outcome of this line from Echo, like, he, he loses his board almost always, right? Mm -hmm. By the, choosing to leave all that power on the board, especially with Fandral that can make things like, you know, Wrath and Living Roots more effective, his board is going to go bye-bye almost all the time. Right. So he has to do 17 a lot of the time. Like, so let's say 16 ambitiously. Let's say he has to hero power a squire like that. Oh, so, oh, yeah, you are basically exactly on the Doomhammer draw to be able to win this game. So Which he got. Yeah, I mean, fa <laughs> fair to say, I guess, that Ecot played to his outs. But... Going the other way, what's your expected outcome if you burn your entire hand against a druid who's got two more cards to come and you've still got to do 16 damage later somehow? Right. So I think if he'd have rolled a spell power totem there, then he had a nicer clear on the Fandral. And that way he could have played for board dominance again and right. gone, kill your Fandral, kill your Panther, play a 5-5, I control the board again. Uh, but without the spell, spell damage totem, it wasn't really possible to, to achieve that level of board dominance. So I think Ecop assessed that situation correctly in the end and said, all right, this is a Doomhammer game. Yeah. I'm just going to draw that and win the game. But Ancient of War just ends up being way too crushing for him in the end. And it turns out that taking 20 to your own face, even as an aggro shaman, is probably just a bit too much. Yeah. <laughs> About that. So nourish into wrath number two is lethal if wrath number two is still in the deck. Uh, well, Yogg's lethal, we know that. <laughs> uh, there we go. Innovate. Play more than I do. Innovate Swipe is lethal as well. Perfect. And minions will go face, and Vince will take game one here against Ecop. And Ecop was uh, was was had his own opinions on who were the favourites in these in this top eight uh, lineup earlier on this morning when you were talking to him, Neil. But I think you'd have to consider him a slight favourite in this in this yeah, top eight I, game. Yeah, I agree. I... Um, so Vince taking uh, a lead here probably is the slight underdog. Yeah, also, I mean, when you've come through the Swiss, uh, both these players came through the Swiss. Yep. So, you know, these guys will want to get this out of the way. I mean, they want to win, but they're going to want to win comfortably because whoever they play in the next round, there's a chance they didn't come through the Swiss. Or is there? It's JJ. No, it's actually, they came through the Swiss as well. So yep. whoever reaches the final is going to have come out of the Swiss. So I'll just change that line of conversation quickly and talk about the next game. Sure. Uh, I think we will end up seeing a Druid mirror here. Um, the, the Druid, this is the best chance, again, from, from Ecop's perspective, this is the best chance to get his Druid rolling to have the mirror here. Um, and then you know, he'll, he'll take his shot against whichever of the aggressive decks that Vince decides to pick into it. Um, so yeah, Druid mirror, just going for the 50-50 shot from Ecop. And again, like, I love this matchup when it is not defined by Yogg. Yeah, I think this is one of the most skillful matchups agreed. in the game. Again, if you remove that one card from the equation. Yeah, I agree. It, it's very much about like who has a big tempo or who gets the first big tempo lead, right? Who's who's the first person to get Fandral Power of the Wild, Violet Teacher Power of the Wild, like uncontested Ancient of War down on an empty board, right? That's usually a situation that no one comes back from without Yogg. Um, so if you're taking Yogg out of the equation, but engineering yourself into that position is actually very, very difficult right. to do consistently. So. so with that in mind, how do you feel about turn one Raven Idol when you've already got Innovate in hand? Uh, the, the, the reason I'm asking is you give up information that you could use later on. I think since you know the matchup exactly, you know, you know what cards you want for right. Raven Idol. Um, 
If I actually had this conversation with Life Coach yesterday, I'm still slightly uh, unsold on turn one Raven Idol. Um, I am, have reached the point where like, if Violet Teacher or Fandral is in my hand, I will not cast turn one Raven Idol, as long as I have ramp already. Right. If I don't have ramp, I'm looking for ramp, regardless. Turn one Raven Idol gets cast, sure. and I'm so looking for ramp. This was an innovate Raven Idol keep, and I thought keeping the Raven Idol maybe was a bit interesting, where right. you might look for something to innovate out on turn three, turn four, turn two. Sure. But yeah, like so he doesn't have Violet Teacher or Fandral in his hand, which are like the synergy cards of right. Raven Idol. And Life Coach was saying he only keeps Raven Idol in his hand if he has exactly Fandral. He doesn't even think right. Violet Teacher is, is enough. So he goes even further than I do. Okay, so Echo up getting out that turn four, whatever. This, this early Ancient of War, anyway, yeah. with um, both players getting their ramp fairly early here. Hard to keep track of exactly what turn number it is, but yeah, getting it down this early against a 3 2 seems good to me. Yep, and like I said, this is very often matchup defining, which is who just gets a big lead down early. And uh, unfortunately, this wasn't like the, the back and forth mid range battle. This is just one guy ramping out way more powerfully than the other. But Vins does have the answer, but the, uh, the 5 10 on the board with initiative wins this battle most of the time. Right, and um, he's going to be able to just clear this off the board whilst you know, keeping, keeping everything intact. And again, just going back to the Raven Idol, we're going to see Ekop now have a much more clearly defined Raven Idol later in this goal, in the next turn or two. Yeah. Looks like he's going to go for it right now, in fact. He's going to Raven Idol first and then potentially finish up his turn with the, the Nourish that he looked like he was favoring before if he doesn't get anything off this. Uh, wild Growth, probably the most awkward point possible to get up get a Wild Growth. So, yeah, Wisps of the Old Gods is a card that is, you know, borderline in this deck anyway some people include yep. it so it makes sense to pick that up yeah just um even if it gets swiped it gets rid of the swipe that's the absolute disaster scenario and right. it's still fine and, and if it doesn't get swiped you win the game yes so now ecop is uh, is trying to make the decision here nourish nourish swipe as a drake all viable options honestly because you can you can decide to deal with this 510 right now. Uh, although having used the Raven Idol, we can't get yeah. the hero power in with the swipe now. So he's going to have to play a minion here or play the Nourish. And basically he's saying, all right, you attack your 510 into my 510, and then I'll clear it up with swipe the next turn. Right, and I get to see which other things you're going to use to finish it off with, which means I can react with more information yet again to your hand. So yeah, I mean, I, I like this decision, continuing to play for initiative. I didn't hate the, the Nourish either, which looked to be the, the first decision he was trying to make on the turn. He did reach for the Nourish first, but uh, yeah, as a Drake makes sense here, because now there's like a double problem, right? Where not only does he have to deal with the 510, if the Drake is left up as well, then the swipe is just even more efficient next turn. And suddenly, like, ne there's not necessarily a hero power that has to go in there as well. He can pick up something to go along with the swipe. Uh, so I like this setup from Ecop. He's, he's put himself in a strong position. And I really, this is what we're going back to the skill of this matchup again. Both these players have had very, very similar starts. Yeah. And, you know, both players are having to make the same decision each turn with pretty close to complete information, give or take, as well. And, I mean, they'll both be fearing that Yogg and setting up around that. But other than that, you know, the player who plays this the best has got a really good chance of winning this game. And uh, Vin's going for that nourish, the one that Ecop sort of refused. Yeah, yeah, he had a very similar decision to, to Ecop on the previous turn, but he chose to go for the Nourish here because he's just a little bit more desperate for answers. And he actually uh, chose to Nourish for Mana in the end, which is a strange decision. Right, he's feeling that he's going to draw into bigger stuff and just keep putting the, you know, get the advantage by getting two big things down on one turn at some point. But that needs to be next turn or the turn after, because after that your Nourish is negated as Ecop gets to 10 mana himself the slow way. Yep. And then he can draw three cards. If it gets to turn, or to the 10 mana turn, whichever turn that is now, then Eckhart will be in a better position just because he'll have three more cards. Yeah, and like, you know, mana advantage at the start of the game is so much more powerful than mana advantage at this point in the game because it takes longer for your opponent to hit the 10 mana limit to catch you up, right? Because right? there is a limit. Right now, he's only given himself, you know, two, two turns so he's and then got he hits six 10 mana. mana from his nubbish. Right, exactly. If you're on turn four, you've got like exactly. three times six, whatever that is in caster number. Right, so, you know, the, the relative merit of three extra cards versus that total amount of mana that you generate yourself changes how late you use Nourish into the game. And he's basically handed over the eternal resource advantage to Ecop with that play. So, with the Yog in your hand here and you're behind on resources, you're expecting to be playing the Yog. Um, What's, there, are, there are ways to sort of set this up. You, I assume you're trying to draw Ekop into playing as much as possible with your yep. remaining hand, and then relying on Yogg to presumably, you know, you've played a lot of spells, you're going to get a decent run out of it. So 
It's Acop's duty here to not put too much on the board, and it's Vinz's job to try and get him to overcommit. Yeah, I mean, Vinz has a, a, a decent looking hand for setting up this Yog, obviously, oh. because he has enough stuff to demand answers from Ecop, right? He doesn't just have a handful of spells, he's actually got decent initiative minions, so Ecop may have to play onto this board, you know, overcommit to this board in terms of reacting right. to the minions that come down from Vin, so he can potentially get a, a powerful Yog out of this, but Ecop does look like he's happy to just, just for now, just sit back and control a little bit, which is a perfectly understandable reaction, because again, we painted the picture of the texture of the game now from the previous game, Vins went aggressive, ramped his mana and said, I'm gonna like play some huge threats. And Ecop has responded by saying, okay, well I now have resource advantage. So I'm gonna use that resource advantage to just grind you out of this game. Right, and I asked a theoretical question to Life Coach yesterday about, you know, would you rather choose, if on the, on the rare occasion it might happen, mm -hmm. would you choose to play your Yogg first or second? He said, well, it doesn't really matter because if you're playing it first, you probably have already got an ad advantage. So the guy who plays it second reacts to yours, you then get the first counter with more powerful spells. But here's not going to be the case like that because Ecop's letting Vind do everything first. Mm -hmm. And then he's just responding to it with, again, I keep using the phrase, but more information. And it looks here like Ecop might get the chance to choose to respond to Yogg with Yogg. Very, very possible. But again, just like Raven Idol in hand, Living Roots in combination with Azure Drake, Azure Drake itself being a card draw, Wist of the Old Gods, like the, the resource level of the cards that are in Ecop's hand are just so high that he honestly can just chill here. He doesn't, as you said, just doesn't have to make any sort of push. He can just sit back, deal with the board every turn as best he can, make sure he has that Yogg as the ultimate fullback. And as you said, he can just wait and react to what's coming up here. Two cards in his opponent's hand, like, What's the worst that can happen? Right. The answer is Yogg-Saron. That is of always, always in every situation, the worst thing that can happen. But honestly, you feel prepared to deal with it, right? Like based yeah. on the, the size of your hand. And this setup's really interesting because just a reminder, you know, Wisps does have a second function of buffing everything. So playing this turn with the Violet Teacher, first of all, it checks to make sure there's no swipe. And now the Giant's down as well, so even swipe's not good. Yep. And secondly, it just sets up this huge Wisps Savage Raw effect that remains to win the game next turn as well. So we're probably going to see a Yogg right here. I think we're going to see two Yogs back to back here. That's, yeah. That seems incredibly likely to me there. But this is a, a pretty powerful Yogg in terms of number of spells, like easily into double figures, I believe. So it should have a pretty significant impact on this board. Clearing an 8-8 on a wide board is difficult. If it's a single target and things like Entomb, Mind Control, Assassinate, etc. are live, then it's a lot easier. But AoE plus kill a big single target is one of the trickiest things to ask Yogg to do. But still, a big enough Yogg is, is pretty decent odds to be able to do that. Just going back to the resource oh, of the last Pentem. turn. Ekop last turn managed to get a good value out of his Violet Teacher. Yep. He managed to put down an Arcane Giant for zero because of how he played the turn. And he managed to set up his Yogg and Wait. the Risk of the Old Gods for emergency purposes both ways. I dramatically overestimated how many spells were played. Yeah, I mean, there was a few innovates and stuff had gone, but it was still quite early in the game. So there's only like six spells? And here we go. Yeah, and Wisp of the Old Gods is just going to push through and just lethal. The Yogg was just not enough there. My apologies, I thought there was a lot more spells from Vins. I thought there were some Raven Idols and such cast in the early game, but I guess yeah, that was from Ecop instead. No, there was. There was like six or seven spells, but there were no middle spells. Sure. There was, there was right, Raven right, Idols right. and a Wrath, but not much else. All right. I mean, in that case, if it's, you know, a single figure Yogg, then that board of tokens plus 8-8, eight, eight, right. that's really hard for them to do. But with his, with his, the way he played it, he goes, if he gets cleared, he plays his own Yogg. If yep. he doesn't, he wins with Wisp. That's, I just Agreed. liked that setup. I yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I think you, you like elaborated on it very, very well. It's just like, he had the hand that could sure. demand his opponent to but Yogg. he had that hand because he didn't know his mana on turn six when he picked it no, up no, no, and no, thought I mean, about say, it. Like, uh, he put himself in the position and he recognized that he had his hand to say, right, like, you know, Violet Teacher, make a big push, force my opponent to Yogg. Even if he does, I have a Yogg and my Yogg's more powerful because I have been innovating and ravenizing yeah. and living rooting and he had the supercharged Yogg, so he knew he had the fullback to rely on as well. And now this again is the position where Vince's Druid did do okay for him. It picked up that win in a, in a rough right. matchup. So now Ecop has to respond and do the same thing after winning the mirror. Yep, and let's see what he gets from this full mulligan looking for that hand. That'll do. He'll be that happy. looks about right, yeah. <laughs> Those are the cards he wanted in this hand. Yeah, well done. Take. Ecop rifled through his deck and uh, shuffled the four cards he wanted to the top. And he's looking in a pretty good position in this game because of it. So, 
so many choices. How far do you push this opening hand? Um, do you just like rave an idol now, or do you actually save it for the fandom like we were just talking about? Yeah, uh, you turn one teacher. You, you turn, turn one, one teacher, teacher every single time. I think like Raven Idol, like Fandral would be very, very tempting here to a lot of people mm -hmm. because of the, the Raven Idol specifically, but you know, an extra 1-1 one, one on the board from that Raven Idol is right. actually a lot better in an aggro matchup than a random minion in your hand. Yeah, something we talked about yesterday is... Oh, the second Rock Fighter! <laughs> oh, it's savage! Really so something we were talking about yesterday is with um, the proliferation of curve decks and stats, Yeah. One point is gigantic at the moment on the board of yes. anything, of health, of, you know, of attack, because when you push the stats to the limit, you know, one is huge. A 3-4 or 3-5 is just a massive difference. So like you say, just playing that teacher and getting the 1-1 one, one and not getting it killed by a double rock biter is pretty important. Oh, Vince, stop. He's already dead. Why? <laughs> the second rock biter is just so inhumane. It's a criminal. Oh, I mean, I don't know why I'm feeling sorry for the druid player that played turn one Violet Teacher. Like, it's, not, it's not like you're entitled to play a right. five on turn one and get away with it. But I mean, Vince had three innovates in this match the other way around. That's, That's why you're feeling That's true. Yeah, bit. that is true. <laughs> so, yeah, he had his chance with right. triple innovate. And honestly, the living roots there from Ecop is a good pickup as well. That kind of bridges his gap turn. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was making this point with Life Coach yesterday where I think like the power level of Token Druid turns fluctuates more than any other deck in the game, right? They will yep. explode one turn, then whiff the next turn, then explode again, and then you know, have maybe two powerful turns and then another complete whiff. Like that's just how things go. So he, he had a whiff turn there where he needed to just find something to do to bridge the gap. And now he can start doing his powerful things moving forward again. Right, and um, the, the small downside of Vin's having to use double rock biter to kill off the bite teacher is yeah, the Shaman deck is really pushed for resources a lot of the time now, and that is two cards gone. Like, correctly used, had to be used, oh, yeah. but, but they don't do the, the knowledge thing anymore. You don't get a refill of hand as much anymore as you right. used to. So when you do go through two cards and not develop on turn two, you are putting yourself at a long-term disadvantage, even though you obviously have to do that in the short term. Oh, and that Raven Idol, uh, sorry, that Living Roots pickup is actually a big deal as well because Fandral Raving up Raven Idol normally a play you're almost always happy. You know, just Fandral Raven Idol, sure, right. that's a ton of value, but like against this board, it wasn't really going to do too much. But the, the Living Roots, again, the generation of the 1-1s one on the board. double teacher. Right, it's so much better. And he can actually use the Living Roots as well so that his Fandral isn't contested, whereas Fandral Raven Idol would leave his Fandral directly contested on the board. Yep, and two guys coming down. So Doomhammer is going to take care of this, but again, Vinge is already using most of his resources. Oh, well, that helps. Vinge, I was going to say, is using most of his resources just on the defensive as the aggro deck, which is usually bad, but this should help him put both a defense and an attack on the board. Yep, uh, so we will probably see the 3 1 and a Doomhammer go into the 3 5, take care of a 1 1, because uh, you might as well. You're playing for value this turn anyway, so just tidy up the rest of the board as much as possible. 5 5 there being such a big pickup, though, just to be able to make sure you actually tempoed out that turn, because Doomhammer. Doomhammer, when you Doomhammer for board, is usually a two-turn investment, right? The first turn is slow, but then the fact you've already spent that mana to have a Doomhammer equipped lets you go fast the next turn. One of the things, one of the few things in the deck that can allow you to go fast in the same turn is a zero mana, one mana thing from sure. below, for example. Yep. And that's just exactly what he got. So how long before we see Arcane Giant in Aggro Shaman? <laughs> To go uh, with your things. Maybe. All right. If we go back to like the ancestral knowledge list and sure. we just start playing all the spells and lava shock again. I'm just going to overload myself and drop my Nort casting cost 8 right. at the same yeah, why time. Not? Why not? Right. Yeah. I, I think you might have broken the game now. Just broken the game. Sorry, Coming guys. to a ladder near you at rank <laughs> 23. <laughs> wow. You cannot lose stars at this rank or games. <laughs> so. Again, just every decision with Druid is just tough. Um, Nourish is so hard to fit in when you're playing against aggro, but I think it's necessary here. Yeah, he just has he just has nothing. Like Wisp's not really going to be uh, suitable in, or not going to be enough unless he finds stuff to go with it. Really, to push through like Raven Idol into Savage Roar or something to just quickly steal the game. But right now, he's just already taken 11 next turn. There's a Lava Burst in hand. Abusive Sergeant is just extra damage right now. 
Vins is in a, a pretty strong position, and I, I tried to make the point so many times the Druids are crucial in these lineups. They yeah. have to win games that just aren't the mirror match. Yeah, no, at least Ecop did win the mirror match, like yeah. obviously to at least it gives him a something yeah, out yeah, of yeah. it. But and in last year's standing, winning mirror matches, I mean, in any match, but winning mirror matches is often crucial because it it eliminates the resource that you still have. Yes. So, but. If he then loses this, he goes 2-1 down after Vins did win it the other way around. Vins is going to have a really strong position going into the last two games. Yep, so uh, Vins did take his time, but the, the obvious decision did end up getting made, which is just push as much damage as you can, sit on your Lava Burst, see what happens. And uh, Ancient of War is a big deal here. It's at least going to put up a wall, but it's already contested on the board. So Ecop probably doesn't hold out too much hope this is going to be good enough. <laughs> How much face damage do you take here? Do you take all of it? Or have you just won? Uh, so you, if you roll spell damage totem, then you can six it with the lava burst, 10 it with your doom hammer, and then all your board damage goes face, which is only 11. Uh, so no, I don't believe so. Unless there's a flame tongue trickery that changes the maths, then I don't think you have lethal, even with spell yeah. damage totem. Not that it's going to make a huge difference because this board is overwhelming now. Yep. Uh, Druids only have one way to clear overwhelming board, and that costs 10 mana, and he doesn't have it. So, Nor does he have Innovate, which, you know, can, can change the maths and let them operate on Druid time and just innovate, <laughs> sure. innovate Yogg on turn 8 and win the game that way. But yeah, no Mulch, no Yogg, two huge minions on the board. This is what gets Malfurion waking up at night in a cold sweat. It's just like... How do I kill things with more than one health? All my cards are garbage. They're all plants. What do I do? Yeah. And this is the Feral Rage again is good for stabilizing after you've dealt with the board, but unfortunately this board isn't dealt with in any way or form. And he's trying to mulch the 7-7 into a card that says Doomsayer, yeah. Yeah, perfect. And then now all Vince has to do is play the Doomsayer and not attack, and right. Ecop's back. Yeah. Now all Ecop has to do is somehow discover Ancestor's Call that's not even a legal card anymore, sure. rip the Doomsayer out of his hand, and yeah, easy. Or he can just make eyes at his opponent in a scary way. That will also work too, but more importantly, Vince goes out to a 2-1 lead now in the game. His Shaman easily dominating that Druid and you know knocking it out of this series, so now Ecop has to find an answer to the Aggro Shaman. I do believe he has Zoo in his lineup, so that will probably be the go-to. Yeah. But I don't know Vince's list in, in great detail, but we've seen with almost 100% consistency people adding the Maelstrom Portal to the Aggro Shaman deck in this tournament, right. which is helping out this matchup so much. Yeah, like Lightning Storm was a help, but it never really got the job done. You overloaded yourself for the next turn. Your own board was probably already a mess. And then the zoo just go, I'm zoo, here's some more things. Right. But the portal wipes out a lot of the board and gives you, even if it's just one, two or yeah. something, we've said about how much one attack can help. Right. And yeah, that, that card's being added to all these decks and it's so much better in this matchup than Lightning Storm. And Lightning Storm is only in that matchup for the Mirror and for Zoo. Pretty much, yeah. So uh, here's the thing with Maelstrom Portal. Like most of the time, you know, Lightning Storm might just be a complete board clear, right? But then as you said, Zoo just goes minion, minion, go your turn. You don't have any mana to answer initiative because you're overloaded. Maelstrom Portal isn't going to be a complete board clear all the time, but even if you can get yourself into the situation where, you know, say this, this Flame Imp lives at the end of a Maelstrom Portal and it kills a couple of other yeah. minions, and you have a 1-2 versus a 3-1, that's fine because you've still created that point where the board is essentially empty. There's two minions that just trade off each other. And then Zoo goes minion, minion, same situation, but you still have all your mana available to you to, to respond. To like, make 7-7s, seven which Zoo right, doesn't exactly. like. Right, like it's, it's such a strong position to be in and just, even things like, you know, you play Argent Squire, they coin out Dark Peddler, and then you just Maelstrom Portal them on turn two. Like, that's fine. That's a great situation for you. And this is interesting here. Ekop had an amazing starting hand, but it's sort of gone quickly gone south with these two. Yeah. Um, and he's, he was considering, seriously, I think, taking the Divine Shield off, just because if Zoo gets this board, it does win. But... Yeah, he Sorry, does. that was just a little bit too over the top in terms of giving up value. Right, he does have Imp Gang Boss though, which Imp Gang Boss is just the absolute king of this matchup. It's just so tilting to deal with for Shaman. It just almost never happens cleanly. Vins is staring at it like, do I love a boss? Yeah, that that's like... always the only clean way to deal with it. Yeah. And you don't want to just give up one sixth of your opponent's health just to give them a one one. Right, exactly. Right. And uh, Dark Peddler, huge pickup here because it will allow him to fill out his curve perfectly just with those two cards on the right hand side of his hand. Not have to use the Sea Giant and the Doom Guard, they've got a bit clunky. 
Uh, Mortal Coil most likely is the pick here. Although, you know, filling up his hand even more when he's got that Doom Guard in hand might not be the greatest idea. So maybe, maybe there's merit. I was going to say, maybe there's merit to Shield Bearer here just to protect your board a little bit. Draws you two cards, right. kind of. So, like, Mortal Coil just seems obvious there, right? Like, yeah. you Mortal Coil a 1 1, you draw another card, but. I think Ecops just decided he's playing out Sea Giant next turn, followed by Doom Guard, so there's no real reason to start drawing more cards. And Sea Giant gets protected Whoa. by the Shield Bearer. So something we were talking about yesterday is how Agro Shaman is so tightly packed full of great cards now there's no room for Earth Shocks anymore. Well, you're obviously wrong. So there's an, there's an actual living, breathing Earth Shock. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's not much use in this particular situation, but... It's good it's in better this than... matchup, though. Yeah, like, it's exactly. understandable. If you want to play, like, Maelstrom Portal, Earth Shock, Lightning Storm, Aggro Shaman, you're probably, or even maybe slightly favored in this matchup. Earth Shock effective against Ancient of War right now. Ancient of War, one of the biggest cards in the meta. Also, very, very effective against Barnes, if in the right situation, right? Like, yeah. sometimes you would rather give them the stats back than the Death Rattle in a lot Some of Some Crazed Alchemists, Imp Gang Boss, right. deals with... Even the one ones like possessed villagers, stuff yeah, like that, yeah, just yeah. something. But like obviously if like if they barns a high main, you don't just want to like earth shock the high main back to a six four. But if they barns kindly grandmother, yep. boom, like bingo bango, earth shock, job done. Yep. I was just rereading Earth Shock there to make sure it did things in the right order, because I've done Earth Shocks in the yeah, wrong silence order many then times. one damage to it. The most triggering thing to do, ever, I think most people have made this mistake, where you have Flame Tongue Lethal, where you have to kill one of your minions to get it out the way yes. so it goes face, right? So you can Lightning Bolt it to get out of the way, or like something, so something slides over. It's when you try and Earth Shock your Spell Power Totem to get it out of the way so another one slides over, because it silences it first. Yeah, don't so Earthshot your opponent's 1-1 one, one high mains that came from Barnes, kids. Yeah, just Won't don't do that. happen it's, very it's well. It's a bad idea. So. Very, very bad idea. Okay, so the reason we're sort of talking about that sort of stuff is because Aircops is in such a great-looking position here that it seemed more interesting to talk about... Hey, he just threw Earthshot. I mean, right. it was an interesting point. Okay, so all Vins can do is try to challenge this sea giant in some way or form that's that's his short-term plan unfortunately we know there's a doom guard waiting to just tidy up whatever yep. lives out of that and this shield bearer decision is potentially match defining from ecop because i think you know 99 percent of hearthstone players look at that yep. that that discover and go there's a one one on the board i got offered mortal coil snap pick <laughs> mortal coil kill yep. one one yeah but he realized his hand, like right now, he's just been able to play a Doom Guard on this board uh, without losing any value from his hand. And also he wanted to get that Sea Giant played first. And what the Shield Bearer did is protect his minions from being removed, right? Like they yep. had to hit into the Shield Bearer. The Shield Bearer didn't even die. So he made sure with the Shield Bearer that he maxed out his Sea Giant value for the next turn yep. and then minimized his hand size for the Doom Guard on the turn after. And something we always talk about is, you know, your minions as Zoo are uh, everything because they rely on each other to, to become actually powerful. Because most of them are kind of, kind of garbage on their own. It's only when they work with other <laughs> minions they do anything really powerful like Abusive Sergeant is just a 2-1 on his own. It's not really very exciting. Abusive Sergeant is one of the very, very best cards in Hearthstone. If he has friends. Please, please don't call him If garbage. he has friends. If he has friends. Okay, wow. There's a moral to this story. Yes, Anything is possible friends. with the power of friendship. <laughs> that is the most, like, Disney fluffy positive thing I've ever heard you say, Neil. It's also the least likely thing I ever thought was going to come out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, uh, going through the motions here really, um, especially as Echo's managed to protect his life total as well, 22 as zero against Shaman in this situation. The times you lose, the times you're down to 14, 16, and just there's yep. this surprise doom hammer appears, but yeah, it's, this is just us going through the motions here, waiting for game five really, unless, I mean, no, we're waiting for game five. Yeah, I mean, back-to-back -back draws of Doomhammer and Rockbite are even aren't going to win the race. There's no, there's no Feral Spirits to buy a turn. Taunt Totem doesn't change the clock ever. So, yeah, it just, it, it, it's really almost impossible to find a win condition here. Yeah, and Echo will probably see his card and see, well, let's see what it is. Okay, so he will tap, but he would have even considered not tapping if that had been a card he was just going yeah, to like on the Dark board Yeah, like Dark Shack Councilman in yeah. Gang Boss. Like, if it's just a chunky dude, he's like, yeah, okay, I mean, I've won. Like, I don't need to keep tapping. Him. Going back to that decision you were talking about where he took the footman, that's always important to take a second, even over every obvious decision in Hearthstone. Oh. Like, 
that mortar coil was obvious. And yeah, if he'd picked it, nobody would have complained. Yep. But uh, the thing a lot of pro players do, they get criticized was, why is he taking so long? Well, I mean, he didn't take that long, but some people do. Right. Well, he's thinking about, is this definitely the best pick? Because sometimes that 1% is actually, no, let's take the footman. It's actually better. It does all these great things. Yep, and that exact decision in a big part has led him to the point where this power overwhelming is now lethal and Ecop will go ahead and tie up this series and now has his zoo running into the Warlock deck from Vins, which I believe is just a zoo as well, but we will find out I am willing to be surprised. Yeah, well, we've just seen, and there may be tech in there, we've just seen the silence in the Shaman deck. Um, Players who like tech cards tend to keep liking tech cards. Yeah. So we may see a crazed alchemist or you know, one or two mini surprises in the zoo. Right, it, it, it speaks to a, an overall philosophy for the tournament, which is, you know, I understand the meta and I know which cards to use yeah. that are powerful, right? Some people just say, doesn't matter, I'm just gonna play the most consistent build possible and just win that way by just you know curving out effectively, drawing the good cards the most often. Um, but Vins, by including Earthshock, is giving some sort of insight to, he says, no, I'm going to react to what I expect to see. Earthshock is going to be a good card against the meta that I'm coming up And against. so far, it's worked for him reasonably well, coming through a 102-man Swiss plus a world-class group of eight players. So Can't complain. Seems to be doing okay. And this is actually going to be a zoom mirror. So no great surprise from Vins. Both people have the premium one drops. You know, Flame Imp yep. is fine in this matchup. Voidwalker is fine in this matchup. You want Squire and Villager, because Squire and Villager cannot be abused with buffs by the other by the opponent, right? If you just play Flame Imp, Flame Imp, great stats for a one drop. If you just play Voidwalker, Voidwalker, good stats for a one drop. If your opponent has Death Rattle or Divine Shield plus buff, that eats any stats that you have. So you want to make sure that you have those Divine Shields and Death Rattles in the early game as much as possible. Very interesting to me there as well. Echo choosing to keep the whole synergy of the starting hand. So you keep the two one-drops, you keep the juggler. Mm -hmm. And he thought, well, actually, Possess Villager with Power Overwhelming helps me deal with Councilmen, helps me deal with yep. emergencies that may come up. And so choosing to keep Power Overwhelming, which is probably quite an unusual keep, but right. synergized with his entire hand. Yeah, so just, you know, look, just, just to hammer home the point, right? Both of these players do have the, the Divine Shield and Death Rattle 1-drops, right? Imagine if Ecop had to respond to this Argent Squire with a Flame Imp or a Void Walker or Coin 2-drop, for example, like yeah. coin, coin Dark Peddler. Like it's, it's just miserable, right? Like the game just more or less ends on the spot. So this is why it's so important to have these, the correct 1-drops in these matchups. Right. Not just 1-drops, the correct 1-drops. Yeah, and that's something that, I mean, Zoo play and zoo mulliganing and everything about zoo is actually pretty skillful. Yeah. Um, sometimes it doesn't matter so much because you can get away. The reason that I often suggest beginners take up zoo is there's a lot of learning to it, but it's kind of forgiving at the same time. New card! Take the runic egg! Oh. Oh. Runic egg or Rito. So there's two cards here as well that are interesting to me. Is the Forbidden Ritual versus the Knife Juggler. Which player is going to be the greediest with those two cards? Mm. So, yeah, you, you can be as greedy or as not greedy as you like with both of those. Yeah, I imagine if, if Vince doesn't really pick up any initiative here and he hasn't, there's a consideration to just Forbidden Ritual for three or for two this turn with the, the Voidwalker, and he is just going to go ahead and use it for three, so... That, that battle has already been over, but absolutely no fault of Vin's there because you can't just start playing Abusive Sergeants out on the board <laughs> as, your, as your turn. Like, Abusive Sergeant, Abusive Shard Sergeant, yeah. Void Walker, go. Like, that yeah. turn's just appalling. And Echo um, there picked up his knife juggler yeah. to play it. Forbidden Ritual came off the top and he just put it back down briefly and had a think, how greedy? No, let's just carry on. That would be silly to be that greedy, but just, just realize it changed the game very temporarily. Yeah. And again, so, so huge. Like, Ecop looks like, it looks like this game has been completely straightforward for Ecop, right? Like, he, it's already in full control of the game on turn, or turn three for him, in fact, turn four for Vins. That's a big knife. That might just be enough to, to get him back into the game. But unless the, the knife juggler goes down, Forbidden Ritual is going to have something to say about this next turn. Yeah, and... Um... Okay, so he's going to do it this way, this is cool. I was wondering if he might power overwhelming and then Forbidden Ritual for three and then see what's left and just pick it off with the 
in case you have to judge in advance, are the knives going to miss the targets I yep. want to aim sure. for? Oh, come on, knife juggler. Oh, please, come on, be reasonable, knife juggler. Like for that circumstance, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, sure. You have the option of power overwhelming first, just to make sure you're um, you're abusive. That I mean, but yeah. yeah, that scenario is is freakishly unlikely, right? Where just the knife juggler is just left remaining chilling on two health. Like, yeah, it lives on on one health a he decent amount of the time. in a tavern all day drinking. You can't rely on the guy. It's true. And yeah, suddenly, because of the knife juggler hitting the direwolf from Vin's side and because of the weak knife juggler from Ecop's side, this game has actually swung quite significantly. Value versus tempo. Doomguard versus things. I think you can make a decent push here in terms of tempo with the rest of your hand anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, you can use power overwhelming for very little value here just to get a good trade out um, and then empty your hand and, and jam out a Doom Guard next turn. So if he couldn't do that, I'd be a big advocate of just pushing through the, uh, the Doom Guard straight away. But he can actually make a decent turn here. But Imgang Boss, not what he would have been looking for. Something I always like about watching Zoom mirrors is every play on both sides always seems so desperate. It's like, I'm going to use this really big minion to kill your 3-1 and that yeah, sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. Because you just can't try and leave things up. I mean, we say it endlessly, but literally the things they have to do are just so nuts sometimes. It's like, it's like watching beginners play, even though these guys are playing at the highest level sometimes. Yeah, see, this, this is interesting to me because this, this was my plan at the start of the turn, to use the power overwhelming for minimal value there, just to make sure we maintained a 1-1. If that was the case, weren't we better off taking a one-drop minion from the Dark Peddler instead of the Mortal Coil that fills up your hand again with the Doom Guard? Like, we had this exact scenario. We sure, about it and you could have put a, well, there was one mana left over at the right, end of that exactly. turn. Right, and this Doom Guard is now going to come down anyway, so yeah. Uh, sometimes... Nope, never mind. These two three-drops are going to come down. Sure. Ecop knows what he's doing. He knows how to spend six mana on two of the best cards in the deck. Right, and this has just been brutal. I mean... There's been six damage dealt so far, and I think Vince mainly did that to himself. Very possible, yeah. <laughs> the rest of it's just been minions trying to get this board. I mean, this is how you know you've had a good zoo hand. When you're like on turn six and you haven't had to tap yet, you've curved out pretty well. Yeah, right? <laughs> there we go, more damage being done by Vins to Vins. And just starting to get ahead in resources. I mean, each turn is like obviously backwards and forwards in terms of who's winning on board, but Vince is just starting to get slightly ahead in resources in his hand to actually keep that board coming. Yeah, how much do the resources matter though compared to this amount of power that, that Ecop has on board? The soul fire is, is a big deal. That knife is not where he wanted it. Juggler no. not behaving again. Yeah, if that knife had hit the councilman, for example, then we would have had any like, you know, two soul fire options, for example, as to what we wanted to kill. The only small problem with the Doom Guard is something you said earlier about the, the Shaman versus the um the Druid is you can only kill one thing a turn with it, which yeah. is fine. Killing one thing a turn is nice, but it does have that slight downside when you're trying to kill everything. That you, you know, all the power is in one place. Right, but it's at least a, a lot quicker in the sense that it, it kills one thing the turn that you play it, whereas, you know, the, the Arcane sure. Giants, etc., yeah. have to have time to set up, so... Yeah, Vin's making the, the best of a bad job after the juggler two just not two behaving. Abusive's fine. That works, too. Just, just carrying on. Still, Irving, still lovely. yet to life tap. That one damage to face is knife juggler damage, I believe. So, and the abusive looking after his friends yet again. Yep. Oh yes. And now, like you said, like who cares about the cards in hand when you've got a a five seven, a five seven, and an ever growing six five as well. And just the small things again, like that juggle that hits to make a 1-1, one, one. now that 1-1's one, a 3-1, it takes down something big, and that's made a big difference as well. And yeah, this, this is suddenly a board that Vinz is going to have to go all in to clear, and he's not going to be able to probably get rid of everything. Ecop here, this is a pretty crucial decision in the game. He's, he's choosing his options very, very carefully here in terms of what he wants the numbers to do from his opponent. It's not always just purely correct just to take the biggest thing off the board because different amounts of buff on different targets change the breakpoints in different right. ways, right? So if you can try and abuse some way of finding extra value by making what looks like a weird trade, then sometimes that can be appealing to so you. So this abusive sergeant is now challenging the 2-2. Two -two, yes. Which means that that 1-1, one -one, which was living, might end up having to be forced to go in there, but then the 2-2 two -two doesn't do anything because the power overwhelming were overkill. Yeah. Um, so he actually managed to get an extra point out of that, I believe, with this um, power overwhelming that's going to buff the imp, but the 2-2 two -two will trade into 2-1. And the other one has been killed for three. 
Yeah, so, well, you can do it the other way. So if you abusive the 2-2 two -two here, then it's eaten a 2-2 two -two and a 2-1 and a one -one either way, whichever way around you did it, and then you can trade the 1-1 one -one into the 2-1. But then so. you're, um, but the councilman's a 6-4, not a 6-3. Yes. So you clear the board and your councilman's yes. one health bigger. So that's a really great play there from Edgar. Just getting that extra point of health on that councilman, I believe. No, no, no. If you, if you were to draw abusive, for example, I'm talking about it. Like, power sure. overwhelming, yes, you're playing around, for sure. Like, 100% playing around the abusive, uh, power overwhelming. But I'm just thinking about other buffs that are abusive. Sure. Uh, Dire Wolf, example, it doesn't really change too much, but Ecop with a good decision, because there's, there's not really any punishment for what he did, but it is slightly better against one particular Yeah, just once in a while, seeing... you gain a point of yeah. health. So, yeah, Why all not? these things add up, especially in the zoo, they add up. All right, we just drew Doomguard, and this councilman is about to do nine, so we send this downtown and take our opponent down to eight 100% of the time. Trading is over. We had a lot of cute decisions on the previous turns about where we're sending our minions, but now it is time to dome him and make him suffer. Yeah, Aircut looking like he's going to be the first player of the day to reach that semi-final stage. The last four at Insomnia, he's come through the Swiss as well, so... Going to be pretty exciting for Ecop to sit there and watch the next semi-final, or the quarter-final. Ha! And again, the roar from Ecop. You can see yet again how much this means to him. Very, very well played series. Big fan of some of his decisions in that matchup. His mulligan in this Zoom game was very, very important. Having the premium one drops and also decision making towards the end of the game. Very, very much on point. But from Vins, great run for him. A little bit heartbreaking for these players to grind so far and now for everything to come down to single a limb like every yeah. game puts it right on the line but have you been impressed by Vince's tournament? Yeah I mean coming just coming through a huge Swiss again with all that going on behind you a lot of the Swiss players are sat near each other they yeah. they bond quite a bit and you know to come through and beat all those guys and then to go through a massive group come here yeah it's good and hopefully it'll be a breakout for him. Yeah, Raven, anything in particular stand out to you in that series? Yeah, I think, uh, to be honest, I think the whole series, the highlight for me was just that zoom error. It's just pretty much a masterclass in how to play zoo. Yeah. As we said, there was barely, what, six damage on turn five or something yeah, yeah, yeah. total had been taken, which, which really just highlights how much you battle for board and just all the intricate plays you can do with the zoo list, which is why I think, you know, as well as zoo being a very powerful deck, just because it is, like, I think it's why a lot of pros really enjoy the deck because the decision making is very, like, on point a lot of the time you have to be very intricate with your choices I, with the trade-up potential I, I love seeing zoo mirrors where both people have the good one drops yeah yeah, like, yeah if one person gets squire you know it used to be like if one person gets like egg abusive and the other person doesn't but now these days it's like if one person has squire abusive or villager abusive and the other person doesn't then it just snowballs and one person loses but when both players have that premium start it's so interesting to just watch that battle for mid-range control over like turns five and six yeah it's like uh, in general like Hearthstone as well, you either want to see a matchup where both players draw terribly yes. or both players draw yeah, yeah, well. Yeah. You don't want to see like, oh, okay, you got a really strong draws, but we are going to be done for this game and we're going to see the next match coming up soon, which is going to be Fire versus Super JJ. Woo. So stick around, guys. We'll be back soon with the next match. Don't go anywhere.